you know that nobody can suffer the 70 million people? When the 70 million people determined to achieve something, nobody can suppress it. We cannot tolerate anymore all this system. Everything is collapsed. There is no administration. The people are obeying my order, not their order. Legally, I am the authority because people have voted to me. These are the people who gave birth to the dream of Pakistan and for 23 years watched that dream being killed by the military rulers of the Western Wing. They were denied the fruits of their labor. They were denied a voice in their own affairs. They stayed poor so that Islamabad could be rich and with those riches create a powerful military machine. Then in 1971, Pakistan's president, General Yahya Khan, is forced to hear the voice of the people of Bengal expressed for the first time in their history in a free election. They vote overwhelmingly for Sheikh Mujibur Rahman and the Awami League party. The Bengalis do not realize the terrible price they are about to pay. I can tell you one thing. Nobody should play with the fire. Nobody should try to suppress the 70 million people. When they are determined to achieve something, nobody can suppress them. Today, tomorrow, or day after tomorrow, they must win. Victory is ours. Bangladesh was bought with blood. March 1971, the year of the killing begins. While Yahya Khan and the politicians of the West pretend to negotiate with Mujibur Rahman, the Pakistan military machine prepares to crack down. By ship and secret airlift, troops are brought to Dhaka. General Tikka Khan, popularly known as the Butcher, is sworn in as military governor. On the night of March 25th, the army moves to crush Bengal. The army is indiscriminate in its killing. Tank guns are used against these dormitories in Dhaka University. Surviving students and professors are made to dig their own graves before the army shoots them. Religion has no meaning to the army. Bengali mullahs are bayoneted in their mosques. Bengali Christians and Buddhists are shot. This was Dhaka's largest temple. The army reduced it to a pile of rubble after machine gunning all the people inside. Terror and violence become the order of the day in East Bengal. And the reign of terror continues. Dhaka becomes a charnel house. Within days of Tikka Khan's appointment as military governor, whole areas of the city are obliterated and the people burnt to death. The army acts on one conviction, that to be a Bengali is to be a traitor to Pakistan. The Pakistan army stands out across the countryside, looting and killing. And with each new atrocity, the ranks of those who are prepared to fight the army grows. They call themselves the Mukti Bahini, the freedom fighters of Bengal. The Punjabis were here and they took position to against the Liberation Army. From here and they fired the uh, three inches mortar from here and they killed so many innocent Bengalis, Bengali Liberation Army and the innocent Bengali people of the citizen of this town. We resist them with our weapons and uh, just at 4 a.m. they retreat from here and when they retreat they um, burnt all the houses of the innocent people, mm. innocent Bengali people and killed brutally to them through their bayonets and through uh, firing. These women were killed after they had been raped by Pakistani soldiers. When their father tried to prevent the rape, he was bayoneted to death. East Bengal becomes a giant graveyard. White settlers flee, carrying to the world tales of torture and wholesale murder. I saw killing. I saw shooting. I was sitting in the middle of the house while they were shooting just outside, just outside the window. It was under control of the army. And after they gained control, I must tell you, they burned 
on the Bazaar district, where they had no possibility to search thoroughly. So they just burned it up. The Air Force is sent in with Sabre jets to strafe and terrify the population. By the middle of April, it seems that the Pakistan army has won. Mujib is in prison in West Pakistan. The Muftis are in disarray. But in the remnants of the liberated zone, Awami leaders raise their flag and declare Bangladesh an independent country. For those who survived the Pakistan army's pacification techniques, but are too young or too old to fight, the only alternative is escape. Millions flee from Yahya Khan's soldiers and cross the border into India. This is to become the greatest migration of people the world has ever witnessed. In the hastily improvised camp set up by the Indian government to care for the waves of refugees, the Bengalis encounter more death. Cholera is the new enemy. Mothers who have fled for the sake of their children watch them die in the refugee camps. The rich nations of the world promise help. Only a fraction arrives, and so the dying in the camps goes on. The killing in East Bengal continues. Amar. On the night of May 29th, the Pakistani soldiers broke into our house. They took my father outside. A little while later, I climbed up to the roof. I saw my father lying in the front yard. They had shot him. General Furman Ali, military advisor to the governor of East Bengal. We are a very well disciplined army. We are proud of this fact. I deny the um, this accusation of atrocities on the Pakistan army. Mukti commanders disagree. It's the village, they burn it. Uh, no matter how many people are living in that area, they just kill them. At places, uh, they surround the area with gasoline and set it on fire. And any people that come out, they shoot them. Peace and normalcy, as far as physical side is concerned, exists. However, the minds of the people have to be won back and um, the hearts of the people. We are making uh, efforts every day, but it is such a thing that um, so much depends on the uh, propaganda, violent and um, malicious and lies which uh, emanate from India that um, it becomes very difficult for us to bring back this, you know, normalcy in the minds of the people. Whatever the Pakistani generals say in Dhaka, the ever-swelling ranks of the Mukti Bahini are slowly becoming an effective guerrilla army. Students and peasants join in learning jungle warfare. Early training is done without arms or with substitutes such as these bamboo poles. The most promising of the recruits are then trained in the use of firearms by the regular Bengali officers who defected from the East Bengal Regiment and the East Pakistan Rifles. Camps like these multiply throughout Bangladesh. Bengali nationalism acquires a new dimension. The rumors of increasing guerrilla activity demand explanation. 
In July, President Yahya Khan gives his first press conference since the massacre began. Perhaps due to the monsoon, it was their declared aim actually that they would increase it during monsoons. And I think they have done so a little more. But they find that the army is uh, more, uh, more alert in monsoons than in uh, 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 normal times. It's a question of who moves first. Whenever the army has the news that a certain village is being persecuted, uh, being fired at, being uh, grilled by these gorillas, army reaches there. Uh, well, army can't reach everywhere. So what is happening really is that the people themselves are now organizing uh, village defense. The Bengalis were helping the Mufti Bahini. The army in reply creates a paramilitary organization to help them, the Razakars. But many of these also defect to the guerrillas. While the world's press discuss the guerrillas, for India the refugee explosion continues. Indira Gandhi and her government repeatedly tell a deaf world that the refugees are not pawns in a political game. For India, there is no forgetting that the problem concerns the lives of millions of people, those who have fled and those who are still being massacred across the border in Bangladesh. One down. With the monsoons in full force, Bangladesh has become ideal guerrilla territory. The Muktis know their country and its waterways. They have the edge over the Pakistan soldiers. When the army comes out of its barracks, it is forced to adopt guerrilla tactics to fight the guerrillas. Now whole areas are under the flag of Bangladesh. Foreign papers carry news stories datelined Mujib Nagar. This is the name given to every town and village which comes under guerrilla control. In these areas, life assumes a normal face, despite the presence everywhere of armed Mukti soldiers. This town, well inside Bangladesh, is filmed by American journalists in August, who report that there is a town administration, schools, courts and even a newspaper. The town is self-supporting. It places a tax on the major crop, jute, with which it finances all its civil and some of its military activities. It also has a hospital where refugees from the army terror receive aid and care from their own people. In Mujib Nagas like this, mushrooming all over Bangladesh, even children become soldiers for the cause. This is another guerrilla town, filmed by British journalists in September. In armed camps all over Bangladesh, men train for the liberation of their country. But the courage of the Bengalis is no match for the Pakistanis, who are still being armed with modern weapons by China and the United States. Henry Kissinger, Nixon's foreign expert, comes to India to explain the inexplicable that America will not condemn Yahya Khan's brutality. Kissinger goes from Delhi to Islamabad and from Islamabad to Peking, illustrating the line American policy will follow. In the United Nations, Pakistan accuses India of causing famine in Bengal. By indulging in sabotage of food ships, India is trying to create conditions of famine for 75 million people of East Pakistan to fulfill its own political objectives. If the international community is genuinely concerned about possible food shortage in East Pakistan, it has an obligation to prevent India from indulging in activities which, if unchecked, cannot but endanger the substance, the sustenance of the people of East Pakistan. But outside Dhaka, Bengal's most heavily fortified city, the evidence of effective Bengali, not Indian, sabotage techniques is plainly visible. Although a civilian governor has been appointed, the army still controls the province. With each new guerrilla success, the tension in Dhaka grows. Bengali shops fly Pakistani flags or even display pictures of Yahya Khan as insurance against army reprisals. In broad daylight on the main streets of Dhaka, civilians are stopped by soldiers and searched for arms.
The army has begun to feel threatened by the guerrillas it once dismissed with such contempt. And the army has reason to feel threatened. In the heart of Dhaka, guerrilla sabotage units carry out a daring raid on the film section of the Pakistani administration's information office. What? With increasing frequency, Dhaka is rocked by explosions from bombs planted by Mukti saboteurs. The Bengalis have at last begun to win the psychological war against the Pakistan army. The once crowded rivers of Bengal are now empty of commercial traffic. This is the third front of the liberation struggle. Apart from armed conflict and psychological warfare, the Mukti Bahini have declared a policy of economic strangulation so that the rulers of West Pakistan will be forced to capitulate to Bengal's demands. The Pakistan army increases its vigilance over the great rivers of Bangladesh, the Padma and the Meghna. But too many people have fled into India. Too many boats have been shelled or burned. The traders who are left behind are frightened to venture onto the rivers. The refugee concentration in India has now reached the 8 million mark. It is India's hard-pressed economy that is paying a million dollars a day for food and shelter. And it is India's poor who most keenly resent the injustice of so much money being spent on foreigners. In a desperate attempt to disperse the refugees, the Indian government takes thousands to inland camps. But for every group of refugees evacuated, there is another train load to take their place. Even though they are paying for the world's indifference, Indians do not forget the tragedy of Bengal. Months after the first refugee exodus, Indians are still collecting money for the victims of the army crackdown and still hoping they will be given a chance to go back. The Indian position is explained by the Chief Secretary of West Bengal, who has had to deal with the presence of over four million refugees in his state alone. These camps have been segregated from the local population. We regard them as the inmates, as foreigners. We do not want them to get uh, assimilated in the locality. So they have great difficulties. They are all in living this kind of community life under the same tarpaulin. And I'm sure if you give them the facilities to go back, they will go back. My message of amnesty and my uh, message of asking them to come home has not been conveyed to them. First. Second. My borders are troubled. Not by me, but by my neighbor. Shelling by field guns, mortaring by mortars. Activities by infiltrators, armed infiltrators across the border are continuing. I uh, would like to know which displaced person, a civilian, would like to cross that border under those conditions. President Yahya Khan forgets that civilians are crossing the border, but not in search of amnesty. They brave the crossfire in order to escape from East Bengal and the continuing brutality of the Pakistan army. In the West, the Pakistani people are not aware of the disastrous results of Yahya Khan's policy of genocide in Bengal. The demand for war with India grows daily. I'm not looking for war. I'm trying to avert it by showing a lot of patience. But there's a limit to our patience too. So we're very close to it. I'm equally going to be very, make it very clear that if war is forced on us uh, through a means of some action in East Pakistan. An attack on East Pakistan is an attack on Pakistan as a whole. But it is Yahya Khan who unleashed the war in Bangladesh. An unequal war in which soldiers are pitted against children. 
And it is the mothers of Bengal who wear the face of patience and of despair. They watch their children, those who have survived the journeys and the cholera, waste away from the slow death of protein malnutrition. Experts predict that hundreds of thousands of children will die within months. Those children who survive will be physically and mentally retarded for life. The foreign press, international statesmen, writers, musicians and thousands of ordinary people champion the cause of Bangladesh, but their governments remain indifferent. A British relief worker in the refugee camps says, I cannot really believe that the world is being so silent and so complacent about an issue which must be, in anybody's book, the worst kind of disaster that's been experienced. So I, I you know, just sitting and seeing this happen, um, one just doesn't know who to appeal to. I mean, who do you ask next to come and see this, come and report this, come and, come and do something about this? One doesn't seem to get the impression that the world is really aware, however much has happened. One seems to think that they've closed the book on the refugee situation in West Bengal and are now waiting for the next disaster to rouse them to do something. You've spoken of the first... In November, the Indian Prime Minister tours the world to explain again the gravity of the situation. Uh, you said that first of all... In capital after capital, she pleads the Bengali cause. In London, she is asked what can be done to stop the refugee exodus. Well, 